The presidential campaign has closed in Bolivia with President Eva Morales promising to defeat neoliberalism. Cuba's president is greeted with full honors in Mexico City. And Haitian police fire in the air as mourners gather for the funerals of slain protesters. From the headquarters of Talisur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South. I am Doris Polo. Campaigning has come to a close in Bolivia ahead of Sunday's presidential election. President Evo Morales, who is seeking another term, held his final rally in El Alto outside La Paz. Morales remains the favorite to win on Sunday, and he may score a victory in the first round. The opposition is divided between eight candidates and has said it will not recognize a victory by the president. I want to tell you all that in these elections, we'll once again beat those who want to sell out the homeland. We'll beat the neoliberals. Sisters and brothers, we will beat those who want to privatize our natural resources. The president of Bolivia's Supreme Electoral Court, along with the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, gave details of the election preparations. This coordination work, as usual, has always been carried out in different electoral processes. Coordination is at the level of the Supreme Electoral Tribunal, the Plurinational Electoral Body, the EPO, and also at the level of the Department of Courts. I would like to publicly thank you also for participating in the distribution. Thank you also. Our correspondent in La Paz, Freddy Morales, has more on the election preparations. The situation here in La Paz ahead of the elections is very calm. No problems have been reported in the delivery of the election materials to the voting centres. This process began at the beginning of the week to reach the most remote rural areas and ensure that everyone can cast their ballot on Sunday. The Electoral Tribunal has had meetings with various delegates from international observer missions. More than 230 election experts from around the world are taking part to accompany the vote. They will be present not not only in the nine department, departmental capitals, in the main cities, but also in rural communities. And the electoral tribunal is giving a lot of importance to this. You will remember that for the first time, these elections are using a voter registration that has been audited by the Organization of American States. That was something that the opposition was demanding for several years, and now it's being put into practice for the first time. Of course, the opposition now says it doesn't trust the work done by the OAS, more than 20,000 members of the armed forces and police will be deployed at all of the 15,000 or more voting centres to ensure security from midnight on Wednesday. All kinds of campaign propaganda have been forbidden from all nine candidates hoping to be elected president for the next period. On Sunday, voters will also elect members of the Senate and lower house, also for a period of five years. That was Freddie Morales with that report. The Cuban president Miguel Diaz-Canel is in Mexico for an official visit. The Cuban president and his wife were welcomed by President Andres Manuel López Obrador at the National Palace in Mexico City. After the welcoming ceremony, the two leaders went into a closed-door meeting. Before the meeting, Diaz-Canel said the government of Mexico has shared decades of friendship with the people and the government of Cuba, and that Cuba is interested in working with Mexico on projects that benefit both countries. The Mexican president also said he welcomed the visit. We will continue to strengthen our relations and forge policies in keeping with the tradition of respect for the Cuban people, their independence and their right to self-governance. This has been our mandate and this is what is written in our constitution. 
Shifting gears now, funerals in Haiti quickly turned to heated protests when police fired air shots at hundreds of mourners in an attempt to stop a funeral procession near the presidential palace. A protest broke out when presidential guards tried to block a road near where hundreds had gathered around the coffins of two victims who had died in the past weeks of demonstrations. A group of mourners retaliated by setting a vehicle on fire and police responded by firing dozens of rounds as most of the crowd took cover the injured were taken to hospital funerals for 11 of at least 20 people killed were held in various cities including the capital port of prince protesters forced haiti's president to hold a private ceremony to commemorate the death of jean jacques de saline one of the country's founding fathers hundreds of armed police officers locked down the surrounding area while protesters who demanded president jovenel moise's resignation began to assemble demonstrators had prevented moise from visiting the site where de saline was killed and where a public ceremony is usually held. Haiti has seen month-long protests against corruption, inflation, and the scarcity of basic goods, including fuel. I am calling on Haitians need to unite to fight this system. The longer Juvenel Moise stays in power, the angrier the younger generation is getting. One day, we will get Juvenel Moise at the National Palace. In the United Nations, uh, Venezuela has just been elected as a member of the Human Rights Council for the next three years. There were celebrations at the UN General Assembly as Venezuela won with 105 votes. The Assembly chose 40 new members for the Council, which is made up of 47 countries. They will take up their seats in January. For Latin America and the Caribbean, Brazil and Costa were also elected. <laughs> Talks are continuing between the Venezuelan government and sectors of the opposition. One of the main issues on the agenda is the preparation of elections next year. But the far right in the National Assembly seems to be blocking the process. The anti-democratic opposition in Venezuela's National Assembly repeats endlessly that they want presidential elections as the culmination of the adventure they embarked on when Juan Guaido declared himself president. They've told the world this is the only solution for Venezuela. Presidential and parliamentary elections at the same time set the date and will nominate a new electoral council. It is a contradictory demand because time marches on and they won't even discuss the election of a new electoral council. This is a necessary step towards legislative elections, which are the only ones contemplated in the Constitution for next year. Everyone in Venezuela can see what they are doing. If they refuse to act, we will denounce them publicly for not seeking solutions. The PSUV group took a positive step by rejoining the Assembly. Now they need to step up so that we can elect a new CNE. If not, the Supreme Court will have to step in and take the decision. The parliamentary committee that should be discussing the preparations for elections is the one chaired by Stalin Gonzalez, second vice president of the National Assembly. But he hasn't turned up in recent days. He was caught on camera in the United States and at a baseball game in Washington. Toda Venezuela los observa. Everyone in Venezuela can see what they're doing. If they refuse to act, we will denounce them publicly for not seeking solutions. The PSUV group took a positive step by rejoining the assembly. Now they need to step up so that we can elect a new CNE. If not, the Supreme Court will have to step in and take the decision. Before a new electoral council can be elected, the National Assembly needs to overcome its breach of the Constitution by removing the candidates who were elected through fraud, then reach an agreement between the opposition and the Chavistas. But the body language doesn't look good. This shows how fragmented the different opposition currents are. Some of them just want to keep their seats in the Assembly. Others are only interested in getting rid of the president. Very soon, we will have elections for the National Assembly, and then we'll see if the imperialists will let the servile lackeys of the right take part or not. We are ready for the elections because the Venezuelan revolution is democratic, constitutional, and rests on the will of the people. Meanwhile, talks are advancing with democratic and non-violent sectors of the opposition. A working group has been set up to draw up proposals for a new National Electoral Council, 
and to discuss election safeguards and a system of proportional representation for minority parties. Coming up, Guyana's High Court rules the cabinet need not resign. Join us for details after the break. Welcome back. People in Ecuador are waiting to hear the outcome of another round of talks between indigenous leaders and the government. The meeting on Wednesday was held behind closed doors and no results have yet been released. It was set to discuss the content of a new decree to replace Decree 883, which removed fuel subsidies and triggered a huge uprising in protest. One of the indigenous leaders, Leonidas Issa, reportedly told the government that any new decree would have to be based on a completely different model of development. Now, just days after the nationwide protests ended in Ecuador, one of the country's unions is threatening to reignite demonstrations, this time against labor reforms. Our correspondent, Denise Herrera, reports from Quito. Hello, we are at the historic center of Quito, where recently one of the organizations of workers, the Food, just announced a new demonstration against the labor reforms. They said that the government didn't accept to talk with all the sectors of workers, and they continue their actions against the labor reforms. They also said that they would discuss the situation with other sectors of workers. Under this situation, the CONAIE and the government just talked yesterday, and they said that they will continue discussing these issues, the uh, labor reforms and the economic measures. They said that they would talk with different sectors also to find a final uh, resolution. That was our correspondent, Denise Herrera, with that report. Guyana's High Court has thrown out an application filed by the opposition for an order mandating that the cabinet, including the president, resigns. In delivering the ruling, the acting Chief Justice deemed the opposition's action wholly misconceived, vexatious, and an absolute abuse of the court. The CJ ordered costs to the respondent in the sum of half a million Guides dollars, which is about 2,400 U.S. dollars. The president has set March 2, 2020 for the holding of elections. The cabinet has continued in office as a caretaker government since the passage of a no-confidence motion against the government last December. The high court struck down the opposition's claim that the Caribbean Court of Justice had overlooked a compulsory order compelling the president to resign. This government is a legal government. The cabinet is a legal entity in the government. That is the ruling of the CCJ. The decision of the Lord Chief Justice has, has restored the, the, the position with the rule of law in Guyana. And it's a, it's a very important principle for a hierarchical system of courts that you follow precedence. And the principle of stare decisis is that you follow the precedent set by the higher courts. And since the CCJ had already determined this issue, whether the cabinet and government should resign, it was not fit nor proper, and, not, and it was of no legal effect for you to come to the lowest court to seek to have that decision of the court, of CCJ, the apex court, overturned. Trinidad and Tobago's Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, has explained that the country's foreign exchange problems cannot be resolved anytime soon. Speaking just over a week after his government delivered a TT $53 billion budget, he said Forex remains a challenge. We have to manage our consumption of foreign exchange because if we spend it out and cannot earn it back, then that's a kind of bankruptcy which makes us um, a pariah in the international financial community, which is why um, the yardstick is that you need to have um, enough foreign exchange for three months cover. That means you, and, and you're on the edge there on the margin. If you go below three months, well, you're, 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 you're technically um, in, in big trouble. If you're just above it, that's not comfortable enough. 
we had up to nine to 12 months cover when we had a lot of cash, earning a lot of cash, high, high oil price and so on, high gas price. But we don't have high oil price. We don't have high gas price. So how many so months cover do you have, we have now? We have about seven and a half months cover, which is well above the level of three months, which is the yardstick. We were told by some of the experts who sought to advise us when we came into office that we would have, if we did not devalue the currency to eight to one or ten to one, we would, in paying our bills and managing our affairs, we would use up those foreign, that foreign exchange reserve that we have inside of a year. Jamaica's Senate has approved 90-day extensions of the states of public emergencies across five parishes. This means the special security measure will now end in January 2020 in Westmoreland, Hanover, St. James, Clarendon, and St. Catherine. The government says since the implementation of the measure in Clarendon six weeks ago, murders have declined by 80%. The Prime Minister is holding anti-crime talks with the opposition and civil society groups. Reporting for GIT. A Ghani court has suspended the trial of eight opposition leaders accused of organizing protests against the president, Alpha Condi. The eight leaders were arrested on Saturday and charged with making statements to disturb public order by calling for demonstrations. At least nine people were killed in three days of protests against the president's push for constitutional reform, which are seen as a way for him to seek a third term in office. <laughs> Stakeholders in Mozambique have expressed concern that reports of voting irregularities in Tuesday's polls could lead to an outbreak of violence. Opposition parties and civil society groups have accused the ruling party of engaging in electoral malpractices such as stuffing ballot boxes and chasing observers from polling stations. According to the police, 17 people have been arrested on suspicion of attempting to interfere with vote counting in 10 polling stations in the central province of Zambezia. While the election was generally conducted in a peaceful manner, sporadic cases of violence were reported in Shai Shai district where an election observer was killed during clashes between government and opposition supporters. Our correspondent Matuba Malatji has more on this election. Election observers in Mozambique say these elections that took place on Tuesday were largely free and fair and they say that the minor hook hiccups that took place during this election period are not enough to influence the final outcome of the results we expect to see on Friday. But this election came at a very costly price and that is human life. In the northern parts of Mozambique, we saw at least 200 people reported dead because of the insurgency that's been reoccurring in that part of the country. But for the election period, we understand that 200 people have been killed and this has, not, has had an impact on people who live there because there were no polling stations sent to the northern parts of Mozambique fearing insurgency and more violence. But now, with the ex election results expected uh, on Friday, we expect Frelimo to extend its long-time rule of the country. President Philippe Nyusi will most definitely, most likely rather, uh, be in office for another term as the Renamo opposition party trails behind with votes according to the preliminary results that we've seen uh, recently. And a healthy democracy in Mozambique means uh, stability uh, on, for the Sadek region, uh, but then it remains to be seen how President Philip Nusi deals with the insurgency that is still ongoing in the northern parts of Mozambique. It's back to your studio. We'll take a short break now. When we come back, Catalan's protest against the sentencing of nine separatist leaders for the fourth day. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Turkey has agreed to suspend its military operations in northern Syria to let Kurdish-led forces withdraw. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence has made the announcement after he and a high-level delegation held talks with Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan in Ankara. Coming out of that five-hour-long meeting, Pence said there will 
be a pause in military operations for five days. And once that is completed, Turkey has agreed to a permanent ceasefire, after which the U.S. will withdraw recent sanctions it imposed on Turkey. The today, the United States and Turkey have agreed to a ceasefire in Syria. The Turkish side will pause Operation Peace Spring in order to allow for the withdrawal of YPG forces from the safe zone for 120 hours. All military operations under Operation Peace Spring will be paused and Operation Peace Spring will be halted entirely on completion of the withdrawal. Our administration has already been in contact with Syrian Defense Forces, and we have already begun to facilitate their safe withdrawal from the nearly 20-mile wide safe zone area. Meanwhile, Turkey's foreign minister is making it clear that the agreement reached between the U.S. and Turkey to suspend military operations in Syria is not a ceasefire. We will pause Operation Peace Spring in order to allow for the withdrawal of PKK YPG forces from the safe zone for 120 hours. Not a ceasefire. We are only pausing. This is not a ceasefire. Ceasefires can be done only between two legitimate sides. We are only pausing the operation to allow the terrorist groups, which are the targets of the operation, withdrawal from the safe zone. And a Russian flag was seen flying on a demolished building in Zormagar, a border town in Syria, which Kurdish militant groups controlled. Before the Turkish military offensive, earlier on Thursday, Russia's foreign ministry spokeswoman said Syria should get control over its border with Turkey as part of any settlement of the conflict in the region. In other news, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has hammered out a last-minute Brexit deal. But he will now have to win approval for the draft deal in the British Parliament, a rare sitting scheduled for Saturday. Johnson is currently in Brussels, Belgium, for an EU summit where the exit of the United Kingdom has topped the agenda. The deal still has to be approved by all 27 member countries and the British Parliament. Although key allies have spoken out against the deal struck with the EU, Johnson has expressed confidence that the Parliament would support it. And while it may not be easy for Prime Minister Johnson to get approval for the New Deal in the British Parliament, his allies in Northern Ireland, the DUP, say they don't agree with it. And the Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn says it is worse than the deal negotiated by the former Prime Minister Theresa May, which the House of Commons voted down three times. From what we've read of this deal, it doesn't meet uh, our demands or our expectations. It uh, creates a border down the Irish Sea between uh, Britain and Northern Ireland and it leads once again to a race to the bottom in rights and protections for British citizens and the danger, a bigger problem, sorry, it, uh, a danger of the sell-off of our national assets to American com Could you corporations. We are uh, unhappy with this deal and as it stands we'll vote against it, though obviously we need to see all of the last details of it. Thousands of students have taken to the streets in Barcelona in a fourth day of protests against the jail sentences handed out to independence leaders. After three nights of severe police repression against the protesters, Thursday's march has been peaceful so far. 97 protesters have been arrested since Monday, and the regional Catalan government has condemned violence by protesters. However, many students say the police are to blame. It's really bad because President Torra criticized the sentences and then sends the Catalan police, the Mossos de Squadra, to repress those who are fighting against the sentences. This is a super hypocritical and what we demand is the resignation of the Catalan Interior Minister Mikel Boc. The president's speech was terrible. They want to demobilize us. We need leaders. We do not have leaders. They do not support us. Israeli forces have fired tear gas and rubber bullets at Palestinians protesting against land seizures for Jewish settlements in the occupied West Bank. According to eyewitnesses, dozens of the protesters were injured in the village Tumusaya. Israeli protesters also gathered on the hill that views Tumusaya, calling on the government to build a new settlement. Land seizures are among the disputes stalling peace efforts in the region.
We have two concerns. First of all, uh, that it's very close to the village of Michai. It's only 50 meters away and it's very dangerous. Second of all, is that it's our land. All the land of Israel is our land and we're supposed to build here a new village and not the Arabs. That brings us to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at tellusurenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tellusur English, I'm Doris Polo. Thank you for watching.